Welcome to Over My Dead Pod, a true crime comedy podcast. I'm Kylie Caldwell. I'm Kate Carter. And I'm Holly Spear. And today I'm going to talk to about the murder of Lacey Peterson and her unborn son, Connor, the case which inspired one of my favorite movies, and I'm guessing by Kate's face, her too, Gone Girl. This is a great story, Kylie. Wow, wow, wow. I'm excited for this one. Now, I must say, you have to do a good job. I hope I do, because this is like one of the OG. OJ, for sure. OG. Okay, so let's get into it. In 1994, Lacey, at the time Rosha, a student at California Polytechnic State University, met good old Scott Peterson, who was a co-worker of a friend. And soon after, when Lacey made the first move, the two began dating. Three years later, by 1997, Scott and Lacey were married. At the time, Scott opened and ran a bar, but shortly after the two decided, you know, they're going to settle down and have kids, they sold the bar and they bought a house in Lacey's hometown of Modesto, California, Mm. infamous house. And then very quickly after, in 2002, Lacey announced to her family and close ones that she was pregnant with their first child a boy who they decided to name Connor. So we're going to fast forward to Christmas time, 2002. So Lacey at the time was 26 and eight months pregnant when all of this shenanigans went down. On December 23rd, 2002, around 5.45 p.m., Lacey and Scott went to Lacey's sister's salon for Scott to get a haircut, which was completely regular thing apparently they did every month together. During this haircut, Scott talked about going to play golf the next morning prior to their family Christmas dinner. And then later that night, around 8.30 p.m., Lacey spoke to her mom, Sharon, on the phone before going to bed. This was the last time anyone other than Scott spoke to Lacey. On the morning of December 24th, so Christmas Eve, at 9.30 a.m., Scott headed out to go fishing at Berkeley Marina, which is about 90 miles from their Modesto home. Scott later reported that prior to him leaving the home, Lacey was watching a cooking show on the living room television and was planning on mopping, baking cookies, and walking their golden retriever, Mackenzie, to a nearby park before her family came over for dinner. Little side note, I tried to find out what happened to Mackenzie after all this, and I couldn't figure anything out. So I hope... That's not good. (laughs) I hope Mackenzie went with Lacey's parents. 10 out of 10, I'm all for human names for pets. But Mackenzie is a little personal. Like, not personal, I just feel like that's a very human like very human. I feel like it's too long. Too many syllables. Yeah. Too many syllables. I feel like for a dog, McKenzie. you gotta be like, McKenzie, get off the counter. Like, yeah. What? Like Kenzie. I don't know. I don't know. Anyways, Catherine, get dog. off the counter. <laughs> Catherine. <laughs> Catherine could be a cat though. I feel like. Catherine Blair, get off the counter. Catherine Blair, you get off the counter. Okay. Continue. So later a neighbor named Karen, of course, of course, service reported that at 10 30 a.m she found the dog mckenzie alone with a muddy leash outside and she put her back in the peterson's fenced in backyard there were several other neighbors who later reported seeing Lacey walking the dog that morning at 2 15 p.m scott left Lacey a voicemail which i think is suspicious when he said hey beautiful it's 2 15 i'm leaving berkeley anytime you know. time stamp your call it's just automatically weird. I know it was like the time before iPhones, but I feel like even flip phones would say what time someone called. It's not a pager, you know? Sketchy. 100%. Sketch. Later, when Scott got home, he later told police he found Mackenzie the dog in the backyard and the house was empty. He immediately took a shower and washed his clothes. Mm. Which I guess normally wouldn't be that suspicious if you're going fishing i would want you to immediately take a shower and not smell like fish in the house but after this i would try to figure out where my wife is first yeah so three hours later at 5 15 p.m he called Lacey's mother sharon asking if Lacey was over at her house because he still hadn't heard anything from Lacey. spoiler alert was not and 15 minutes later after this phone call Lacey's stepfather ron called the police to report Lacey missing So shortly after police arriving at the Peterson home, they located Lacey's keys, wallet, and sunglasses in her purse, which were in her closet. 
usually, you know, you keep those things out. I keep mine out like on the counter somewhere easily yeah. accessible. I find that odd. The dining room table was also set for Christmas family dinner. Another thing, which I didn't know about this case beforehand, but on the kitchen counter when police arrived was a phone book open to a full page ad for a criminal defense attorney. I don't know what to, I don't even know what to say for that. That's okay. so weird. I mean, obviously get an attorney if you're ever going to be like questioned by police, but I feel like that's a little soon considering he doesn't even know what happened. You know, like you think your wife might be missing for three hours. Let me right. call an attorney and then leave it open on the counter for the police to see. So during this initial meeting, when police were over at the Peterson home, they said that Scott was alarmingly calm, did not seem worried one bit, didn't ask any questions, didn't ask to help, was just kind of like, yeah, she's not here. Kind of blase blase. They did take Scott back to the police station that night to question him. Um, because as we likely know, the husband is the number one suspect always. Um, but Scott told the police that he was out golfing all day and he doesn't know what happened. Um, he pretty quickly went back on this and admitted to going out to be out fishing. He also told police that before he went fishing, he drove out to his warehouse where his boat was. He sent some emails from the computer at the warehouse and then headed out on his little fishing expedition and fished for about 90 minutes. And the computer evidence does show that he did send some emails from the warehouse. So he was there at the time he said he was there. So Scott went up fishing for about 90 minutes before dropping the boat back off at the warehouse and heading home. Um, Scott would not voluntarily allow a search of their home. Police had to get a search warrant. But Lacey's family stood by Scott even publicly in press conferences and vigils that Scott was innocent and they did not believe Scott had anything to do with the disappearance of Lacey. The search warrant of the home turned up absolutely nothing, um, but police did remove computers and that was about it. I mean, I guess it's kind of a good thing they stood by him, you know, because if they immediately were like, uh-uh, that should be red, you know, red flags all over the place. Yeah, I guess they didn't have any, like, indication that Scott was a bad person. Yeah. Or she hadn't been, she wasn't found or anything, you know, so it wasn't like they even knew it was a murder case or anything like that. No. So an official search began on Christmas Day. There were over 900 local people volunteering, plus all the officers on horseback, helicopters, and even boats. Police specifically searched the Berkeley Marina where Scott was fishing with sonar equipment, but nothing came up. They also searched the warehouse where Scott stored the boat and where he was prior to going fishing that Christmas Eve, where they located some pliers in the boat that had hair in them. The mitochondrial DNA of the hair matched the hair recovered from Lacey's hairbrush, which they got during the search warrant. So this was big, big news nationwide. A white, soon-to-be mother, seemingly financially well-off, missing. Like, this was everywhere. Um, so the reward quickly grew to over $500,000. Now, on December 31st, on New Year's Eve, the town of Modesto gathered with Lacey's family and Scott for a public vigil. At this time, Lacey's family stood by Scott still, even publicly speaking that they believe Scott was innocent. Now, this vigil, if you've seen Gone Girl, might give you some deja vu because Scott was seen photographed smiling and laughing and even making a phone call while everyone else was crying. You're going to have to like look up the videos of Scott at the vigil because it's not just like a one-off. They mm-hmm. happen to catch a photograph of him smiling at like a split second. He's it like joking. He's like joking the around. Time. The yeah. entire time. Not taking it seriously whatsoever. Are you guys ready for a plot twist? So after this very public vigil that was on the news and stuff, a woman named Amber Frey contacted police to let them know that she knows scott so amber frey is a massage therapist and she told police that she met scott in november of 2002 a little over a month before Lacey's disappearance they met at a party with mutual friends and soon after began a relationship scott had told amber he was single at the time maybe wondering who was scott talking to on the phone at this vigil it was amber ding 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 so what made her come forward? She um, 
had no idea about this. She saw him on the news. At his wife's as vigil. A, yeah. Mm. As, yeah. <laughs> and him listed as a person of interest. She had no idea he was married because, again, he told her she was single. And also, two weeks before Lacey disappeared, he told her that he was widowed and this would be his first Christmas without his wife. So Amber told police all of this, and she agreed to record their future phone calls. So that phone call at the vigil, again, was to Amber. And Scott told Amber he was in Paris with friends celebrating the new year. Not at his missing wife's public vigil. So Amber kept the charade going that she was still with Scott in order to get information and give it to police. However, in mid-January 2003, somehow word leak and there were newspapers threatening to leak pictures of the two which we have now but to beat the news amber held a public press conference outing herself as scott's mistress and this was when Lacey's family abandoned scott obviously a little suspicious Mm -hmm. to have a mistress the nerve of him to think that this could be like so public and he's just gonna like hide it the nerve of him in general i mean Just tell your mistress that you are widowed two weeks before your wife just happens to disappear. I think that's the biggest piece of evidence. Not good. But, of course, Scott thinks he can beat the news. And he went on Good Morning America with Diane Sawyer to clear his name. You can also remember these clips from Mm -hmm. Gone Girl. Um, But this interview did not go as well for Scott as it did for Ben Affleck. Because during the entire interview, Scott referred to Lacey in the past tense. He also said that he informed police of his affair with Amber Frey on the day that Lacey was reported missing and that Lacey knew about the relationship and was okay with it, which, of course, is a total lie. Um, On the day the police showed up to the Petersons' home after receiving the phone call from Lacey's stepdad, Scott told police that his marriage was great and there were no affairs happening on either side. So police did continue to monitor Scott, but meanwhile, there were no leads. They basically had to just wait for him to slip up or wait to find Lacey. And there wouldn't be any public movement that we know about until April 13th, 2003. On this day, a couple walking their dog found the decomposing body of a male fetus along Richmond's Point, Isabel Regional Shoreline Park. A very long name for a park. I just want to say that. Not a fan. Richmond Point, Isabel Regional Shoreline Park. They should change that. Um, Police quickly arrived on the scene to find the fetus who still had the umbilical cord attached but it was torn on the other end instead of cut or clamped, you know, which would usually happen in a birth. Fetus also had nylon tape around his neck, and there was a significant cut on his body. I did not know about the tape until I was researching this. I didn't know about the whole fetus. I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew about that part. I didn't know about the tape. And the very next day, the body of a woman in beige pants, a maternity bra, washed up a mile away from the location of the fetus on the eastern shore of the bay. The woman's body was so decomposed to the point that it was unrecognizable, but she had been decapitated, limbs were missing, and including most of her legs. So I have like a map pulled up, and you can see on the bottom of the map is the Berkeley Marina, where Scott dropped his boat off to go fishing. It was about two miles up is where Lacey's body was found, and then a mile north of that is where Connor's body was found. So a couple days later, on April 18th, DNA tests verified that the bodies were found were of Lacey and Connor. So I'm going to talk about the autopsy a little bit, because I didn't know about any of this either. So I had always thought that Connor had been, like, ripped out of Lacey's body, because that's what it kind of sounded like before. However, the medical examiner, his opinion was that Connor died in utero, most likely after Lacey had already passed, and was later expelled from her decaying body in the water. Here's his reasoning, is that her cervix was intact, so she had not given birth, and apparently his body was not as decomposed as Lacey's. Like, I mean, hers was, like, unrecognizable. Those couple that found Connor could see that it was obviously, like, a male fetus baby. So they think she had died, had been in the water for a little while, and then he... It sounds morbid, but he floated up. So the medical examiner's opinion that she just became so decomposed that he left her body. And that's why he was freshly preserved and she was so decomposed. There wasn't much that he found 
the medical examiner couldn't point to a cause of death or a date of death, obviously, because of the decomposition. So we still don't know if Lacey died the morning of the 24th or perhaps the night before, because again, the last time anyone talked to her other than Scott was like 8.30 p.m. So we have a pretty big window. As for the nylon tape that was on Connor's neck, the medical examiner chalked this up to just being debris or trash in the bay that just happened to be wrapped around his neck. This Body. medical examiner saying it's not a murder, too. Is that what we're going to get you, to? Do you want another plot twist? Stop. The medical Stop. examiner, his name is Dr. Peterson. No mm. relation, apparently. Allegedly, no relation. Um, but he said there were no bruises or sign of trauma on Connor's body. I wish we knew if the tape was, like, wrapped around or if it was just, like, hanging you know, the hard part, none of this was supposed to be released. It was mm. all sealed. Someone ended up leaking the medical examiner's reports later on, but not all of it. Of course, we don't have any photographs of their bodies. I, I tried going on the dark web, but another time. Of course you did, Kylie. Yeah, of course it is. <laughs> the same day that the DNA test verified that this was the body of Lacey and Connor, police went down to La Jolla a neighborhood in San Diego to go mm-hmm. arrest Scott, who was playing golf. So La Jolla neighborhood in San Diego is right on the border of Mexico and 400 miles away from their home in Modesto. If you're just listening, Scott looks a lot rougher than he did at the beginning photos. Well, because Scott had bleached his brown hair to be blonde, mm-hmm. grew out a beard. Looks like he put some weight on. He's killed someone. Red flag. Red flag. Red flag. Another red flag. In his car, which police had attached a little tracking device to, that's how they found him at this golf course, there was $15,000 in cash, survival gear, camping equipment, clothes, four cell phones, and two driver's license, one of which was his brother's. And my favorite thing they found, 12 Viagras. Later, Scott's dad, Lee, chalked all this up to being that Scott was using his brother's license to get a San Diego resident discount at the golf course. And that Scott had been living out of his car in the area to avoid media attention. Of course, the prosecution and the police think he was just trying to book it to Mexico. And you just like happened to be on the border of Mexico the day DNA tests come out. What was with the cash? Was there any excuse for $15,000 of cash? No. Good old Scotty, of course, pled not guilty to two felony counts of murder with premeditation. Um, The trial actually had to be moved to a different county. Because they could not find an impartial jury, which to be expected. And Scott ended up being convicted of the first degree murder of Lacey and the second degree murder of Connor. To me, I guess they didn't get first degree for Connor because of medical examiner's testimony. Saying that Connor just happened to die in utero during the yeah. murder of Lacey. So the medical examiner, I kind of got beef with right now. 100%, 100% in my head, at least that baby died while she was dying as well. And I think an arm as well. Like there's no, there's no way it, it survived. But good old Scott was also sentenced to death in 2004. I didn't know that. But shit gets crazy from here. March of 2019, California Governor Gavin Newsom issued a moratorium for all 737 prisoners on California's death row, postponing all executions. So basically, all 737 prisoners on death row had to get resentenced. Scott appealed his entire conviction, and in August of 2020, so not that long ago, the Supreme Court of California upheld his conviction unanimously, but they overturned his death sentence because the trial judge who was now deceased and could not testify, had dismissed jurors who opposed capital punishment at his original trial. The latest thing to come from Scott's trial was December last year, 2021. Scott was resentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Little fun fact, because I was like, what costs less? Turns out um, housing people on death row is like some substantially more expensive because they have unlimited appeals we need to speak (laughs) about this we all have pets here on over my dead pod but in particular your host today kylie colwell has a kitty cat and her name is bundy after ted bundy and yes no relation and play are you guys ready to get weird so as you guys know i love a good theory well i do definitely believe scott did the shit i want to talk about this burglar theory that has been floating around the internet 
and has made its way into Scott's appeals. So there have been multiple theories, including satanic cults, even the Zodiac Killer, but this burglar theory is the most prominent. So on that same Christmas Eve morning, when police believe Lacey had already been murdered, A burglary occurred at the house directly across the street from the Peterson home. A neighbor, Diane Jackson, saw three men in a van in front of the home. They stole just cash and jewelry and I think a handgun from the house across the street. And Scott's sister-in-law, Janie, who seems to be the only one of the Peterson family, like Dill, talking about this case, she claims that Lacey caught the burglars in the act while she was walking the dog Mackenzie. And they kidnapped and killed her. She also believes that the burglars just happened to dispose of Lacey's body in the area where Scott had been fishing at the time. And she's like a ride or die Scott fan. Police did arrest Donald Pierce and Stephen Todd for the home burglary. And they did question them about Lacey, but cleared them. Obviously. Janie also claims to have talked to witnesses who say they saw Lacey alive after Scott had left to go fishing. And what came up in one of Scott's appeals was that the prosecution never called them as witnesses. No one ever called them as witnesses. But Janie can't name any of them. Um, One of the detectives, Al Pacini, not Al Pacino, told reporters that the woman these witnesses saw wasn't Lacey, but another pregnant lady who just so happened to also have a golden retriever. Defense team did bring up this theory in an effort to show that he was framed. Um, Obviously, that didn't work out. But I want to end on a positive note. On April 1st, 2004, Lacey's parents were in attendance at the White House when President George W. Bush w. signed the W. Anyways, Lacey's parents are with George W. Bush when he signed the Unborn Victims of Violence Act into law, a bill which Lacey's parents were very actively involved in. And this is a federal law that provides that any person who causes the death or injury to an unborn child while in the commission of a crime upon a pregnant woman will be charged with a separate offense. So with Scott's trial, you know, he got convicted of first degree murder for Lacey, but second degree for Connor. If this law was in effect at the time, he likely would have been found convicted of first degree for both of them. And with that, this is Over My Dead Pod, and we will see you next week.